Thank you. Thanks. It's my, it's my hometown crowd. That's great. Thanks for coming out. So my goal in the next 35, 40 minutes uh, will be to get to the, the deep ideas in the book, the bigger ideas in the book. Um, but those are ideas that are not just about ecology and science. They're also ideas about storytelling and language. So I'll be kind of dipping into the book now and then uh, to give you a feeling for the, the language and maybe some of the characters and a little bit of the plot. Mostly just talking about ideas, but touching here every once in a while. And uh, let me get started that way, too. I'll plunge in. A school of needlefish parts to stream around me, and I find myself momentarily among the silver traces of a comet shower. I move to join them, but they accelerate and dissolve into open water, leaving me to stare at the luminous molten mirror that is the underside of the ocean's surface. Veronica taps my arm, a signal that says both look at that and be right back, as she slips from the roiled layer of silver and descends swiftly like a being born underwater. Her skin diver's fins form a single broad fluke, which propels her neoprene form sinuously toward the rocky bottom. Bright bubbles, escaping her snorkel, wobble urgently back to the air above. A thousand times I have seen her descend like this, yet still I find myself wondering if, this time, she might go too deep or stay too long. Here, mercifully, the seafloor is only 20 feet down, a depth at which the plunging shoots of sunlight are just converging to their vanishing point. As she approaches the rocks, Veronica twists, glides to a supine and weightless pause, and gazes up at the students who float beside me here at the surface. She seems to be pointing at something on the seafloor. Allie, the student to my right, turns to look at me. Inside the partial shade of her dive mask, her eyes are hard to read. They look puzzled, a little concerned. She is probably just wondering why Veronica wants them to notice what appears to be a mud-brown lump of sea muck though it also seems possible that Allie has already perceived Veronica's tendencies underwater, the strange private gravity that seems to draw her to depth. And she is now asking, in her gentle way, whether something should perhaps be done to bring Veronica back to the surface. I take several long breaths, saturating my blood with oxygen and preparing to dive. But just as I draw my last deep dose of air, Veronica finally relents. She places her hand gently around the nondescript mound and pulls it from the rocks holding it as one might hold a soft loaf of bread. Arriving among us, Veronica holds out her hand, upon which rests her inert query. What was mud-colored below is now, in this bright, shallow water, more of a yellow ochre, and it is studded with pale tubercles that are almost the color of lemon drops. The skin, stretched taut over the knobby body, appears thin and mucosal, making the thing look terribly exposed, like a bodily organ drawn by the hand of a surgeon into the sudden brightness of the operating theater. The students, there are five of them here, draw in around Veronica's palm, peering intently through their panes of tempered glass. They seem transfixed, certain that Veronica's plunge must have been for something thrilling. The lump trembles, inches forward along Veronica's palm. Suddenly it is less vegetable than animal, and the students pull back apprehensively. But as the circle of masks starts to widen, Veronica's free hand catches Allie by the wrist. Veronica is wise, I think, to choose Allie, because there are others who might not be so trusting. Carefully, she opens Allie's palm and holds it beside her own. As the knobby creature slides from one hand to the other, Allie's eyes widen and she speaks into her snorkel, an incomprehensible but richly expressive string of syllables. For a moment, she seems frozen, but even in her astonishment, she looks to the other students. She takes the hand of the young man floating beside her, opens his palm, and holds it next to her own. The animal slides over obligingly, and as it does, Cameron explores the creature's back with his other hand. Cameron's hands look muscular, well-worn, and they sometimes move in unusual ways. The fingers seem to explore independently, executing many minor adjustments, as if they were navigating the neck of a string instrument. These hands have learned to perceive more than other hands because Cameron cannot see. He is blind. And as his fingers creep across the animal's back investigating, it becomes clear that they are following a pattern. The yellow warts, which at first seemed to be scattered more or less randomly, are in fact arranged, 
loosely but nonetheless perceptibly, into two rows. I have never noticed this rough regularity, but now that I see it, I suspect it might be meaningful. I suspect, in fact, that those two haphazard rows are clues to a deep connection, an invisible but very real thread that links the ugly animal on Cameron's hand to far more beautiful creatures we've seen this morning. Just moments before her plunge, Veronica pointed us to a sun star, Heliaster cubinigi, a pink and green starfish in the unmistakable shape of a sunflower. And before that, we all hovered in admiration over the crowned sea urchin, Centrostephanus coronatus, which is a sphere of long and slender spines, each one perfectly black but for the occasional sharp wave of blue light that races from tip to base. To describe these scattered pulses to Cameron, Ali said it looked like an alien's brain. So what Cameron's hands on the animal revealed uh, was that this ugly little creature, which is called Isostichopus fuscus, is actually related in a deep way to those beautiful creatures we saw. They're all members of phylum Echinodermata. And what that means is that they all descended from a single species that was in the ocean 520 million years ago. It was an Urachinoderm. And that Urachinoderm, in its time in the water, uh, hit upon some extraordinary innovations. You could think of them as inventions. And those inventions were passed down to its various descendants, Centrostephanus coronatus, Heliaster cubinigi, all those pretty things, as well as the ugly little lump on Veronica's hand. Veronica wanted to show them one of those innovations. The innovation she wanted to show them uh, is something called mutable connective tissue. And I just want to explain what that is and how it works so that you understand the next, the next part of the story. Mutable connective tissue is really just collagen, uh, the same stuff that's in your knees or you know, the discs in your spine or the makes your nose kind of hard. But what that urachinoderm discovered was uh, a remarkable trick with collagen. Collagen is a polymer, which means it's made up of many little molecules, many copies of the same little molecule, all twisted together. It's sort of like uh, the twist ties you get at the supermarket, but all wound up into something like a suspension bridge cable. And it's always wound up into suspension bridge cables in our, in our bodies. But in, this, in, the, in the echinoderms, there are cells that are embedded in the matrix of uh, collagen that can release a special substance. <laughs> this is amazing. Sorry, I keep, sorry. I keep seeing people I've known since I was five. For those of you, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I, I grew up here, so I'm coming, I'm coming back and trying to keep my concentration while I've got my first grade teacher, my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> oh, man. And now Mo walks in, who I've known since I was two. Um, so anyway, collagen uh, in the echinoderm, special cells in the collagen matrix, uh, releases a compound that cause all those twist ties suddenly to unwind, fall apart from the cable form into a billion separate copies of the same molecule. At, at the level of the animal, what that looks like is something that's billiard ball hard goes just putting soft in a second. Um, more remarkably, what the, what the animal can do is it can repolymerize, put those uh, twist ties back together to make a new suspension bridge cable. So that means the animal goes from being liquid to, to, to hard just as quickly in a flash. So that's what Veronica wanted to show them. She happened to decide to do this uh, at a moment when the brown sea cucumber was sitting on the hands of a student named Anoop. And Anoop was a little less comfortable in the water than our other students. And so he, was, you know, he had the animal on his hands. And we'd all, we'd all taken our snorkels out of our mouths at this point. And so he was sitting there with his mouth above the water, just trying to stay up at the moment that Veronica decides that she's going to show them the tricks of mutable connective tissue. At the moment, the most pressing mystery is why Veronica would take a noop of all people as her volunteer for a magic trick with mutable connective tissue. Given that we will try this only once in our two-week course, I don't see why she would make a noop the one whose nerves will be tested. Does she think his excitability will enhance the shock of transformation? 
Or has she really put him on my watch, allowing herself to forget her own warnings? In any case, when she places her snorkel in her mouth and puts her face in the water, all of us follow suit, except Anoop. With the animal stranded on his trembling hands, he is unable to replace his snorkel and is left alone above water while everyone watches his hands below. Through my half-submerged mask, I keep a watchful eye on Anoop's face. At first, he looks somewhat resigned, like a surgical patient separated from the doctor's work by a curtain across his chest. But a second later, he whips his head suddenly to the side, trying to catch his snorkel's mouthpiece with his teeth. He makes three such lunges, each of them unsuccessful, before he gives up, takes a deep breath, and submerges his face, just in time to see Veronica's index finger pressing on the animal's back. The creature compresses instantly, but Anoop holds steady. Veronica places Cameron's hand on the frozen animal, and the other students, too, feel the hardness of cross-linked collagen. As Anoop watches their hands reaching in to investigate, his cheeks begin to swell with the pressure of unexhaled breath. And just when it appears they might burst open, admitting a gasp of seawater, Allie reaches across our circle and places Anoop's snorkel in his mouth. Through his glinting mask, he seems to look gratefully at her. Veronica begins to rub the animal's back, and at first, it appears to relax. But then something goes wrong. The creature skips liquefaction and moves straight to more drastic measures, the last line of defense. Because an echinoderm's nervous system speaks directly to those special cells embedded in the collagen matrix, telling them when to release their potent catalyst of change, the animal can release, can freeze, or liquefy whichever piece of tissue it needs to. This is how a brittle star caught by the arm can throw off the entire limb, leaving it behind like the detached tail of a lizard. It simply liquefies the narrow segment of tissue that connects the arm to the central disc. And when a cucumber is under attack, it resorts to an even more radical tactic. It swiftly disassembles the collagen cables that hold its organs, violently contracts its entire body wall, and shoots its viscera out its anus. One can imagine that even the most menacing predator might be taken aback by such a move. <laughs> and even if it weren't, it might at least be tricked into pursuing the evacuated innards instead of the now hollow cucumber. Taking a bite of floating viscera, the predator would quickly learn that the animal is laced with a powerful toxin. The hollow cucumber, meanwhile, would have moved on and would later regenerate from stem cells in its empty body cavity a complete set of internal organs. But if evisceration might distract a menacing predator, just think what it could do to a noop. When the dark purple organs explode from the animal's posterior, he startles and flails, attempting to back away quickly. The guts purl and twist in his turbulence, forming a kinetic design of dark ribbons, diffusing colors, and loose round forms at the center of our circle. From the bottom of this turning mobile, the cucumber body sinks toward the sea floor. <laughs> so, so later that day, I was um, sitting on the terrace of, of our field station. And at the far end of that terrace were um, those same five students. And they were kind of reliving the moment. Anoop was reenacting it for the others. And they, when they got a breather from laughing, Cameron called to me. I actually don't know how he knew I was there, but he called over. He said, hey, Aaron, why doesn't somebody just eat that thing? So I moved over with them. And for the next few hours, we talked about this ugly little animal. We talked about um, that toxin, holothurin and how it is presently being used as a model for the development of uh, chemotherapy agents, because it's a powerful cytolytic agent. And we talked about uh, the, the market for these animals in East Asia. They're actually a, a coveted uh, fishery product. So um, the dried bodies are shipped to East Asia. And we talked about some deep ideas uh, in evolution that are that are kind of clearly illustrated by this little animal. The idea of recapitulation, for example, that the development of any single organism is a reiteration of that animal's deep evolutionary history. So if you want to see a glimpse of its deep past, that urachinoderm 520 million years ago, you have to look at its early, early embryological stages. It's an idea that the German idealists got really into in the, in the 19th century. So, I don't want to focus on all that. I, I just want to pay attention to what was happening there on the terrace. We were taking this ugly little animal and telling stories that started there. We were letting it be the origin for our, uh, our narratives, essentially. And we were letting ourselves be digressive. We were just following those threads 
of narrative outward from the animal. And at the end of the conversation, Cameron sort of summarized this very, I thought very poignantly. He, he talked like a surfer because he was from Santa Barbara. Um, but his line stayed with me. He said at the end of our conversation, do you realize that that entire gnarly conversation started with that knobby thing that puked on a noop? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it sounds funny, but I took it home with me and uh, thought about it for quite a while. Uh, and it struck me as a kind of, uh, a kind of solution, that, that line to a big problem that has troubled me in Bahia and other places I've been to, a question. That question, that big question is this. Why are we, wherever we go, such terrible stewards of the natural world? Why do we, all over the world's oceans, overfish the fish populations? Why do we, in every forest, degrade the landscape? What is it about us that leads us to, to do this again and again in every place? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it had to do with, uh, with memory and perception. Um, and I'll start with memory. The, the problem with our memory of the landscape is that I think each of us takes our own experience, our own recollection of the, of the most abundant seas we ever see, we've ever seen or the most pristine forest we know, and we take that as our exemplar of the pristine. We think that, you know, that is nature. But in fact, we're wrong. Our earliest memory, our idea of what's wildest is in fact a seascape or a landscape that is already severely degraded no matter where we're talking about. And I, I'll illustrate this with this same little ugly animal. Because the first time I went to the Sea of Cortez with Veronica, she showed me a brown sea cucumber. And I completely misinterpreted the moment. I'd never seen a big cucumber before. I'd been diving in other places, but never come across this. And so I took that discovery as a, as a sign of the bay's ecological health. I thought, ooh, I'm finding this weird, rare animal here. I haven't seen it anywhere else. This place must be remote and pristine and, and, and undiscovered. But I could have, in fact, just as well taken it as a reminder of the bay's degradation because shortly before I arrived, uh, there had been many, many more cucumbers uh, on those rocky reefs. Veronica had sat in 1995, I think, on that same terrace and looked out across the bay as boat after boat returned piled high with brown sea cucumbers because there had been a spike in the price on that Asian market. And that one season of intensive fishing changed the reef from a place that was abundant with these cucumbers to a place where finding one is a special occasion and we gather the students to see it. So the point is, I, without that deeper memory, I. I had no sense that what I was seeing was a degraded reef. To the contrary, I thought, it was, I thought this was a sign of its, of its virginal status. Um, you could say, well, it's because, it's because I'm a foreigner. You know, I'm, I'm not local. I'm just there visiting. But, but really, there's an entire generation of uh, people in Bahia de Los Angeles, anyone under the age of... 17 or something, who has never seen a reef rich in brown sea cucumbers. So for them too, the state of nature is the rarity of these animals. Fisheries managers refer to the problem of shifting baselines. That's the term they use. And what they mean is uh, each generation of manager has its own baseline for what is natural. And that baseline shifts each generation towards a state of greater and greater scarcity of the fish because we come, the, the, the reef we come to is the reef we think of as wild and then it decays over the course of our life. It happens again and again and again. And what's, in a way what's most dismaying is that this has been going on for centuries. Not only that, for centuries people have been realizing that th what they thought was a pristine landscape in fact was degraded. People have been aware of the problem of shifting baseline for decades and centuries. This, I wanna read a little passage from uh, the Journal of Henry David Thoreau. 
I take infinite pains to know all the phenomena of the spring, for instance, thinking that I have here the entire poem. And then, to my chagrin, I hear that it is but an imperfect copy, that my ancestors have torn out many of the first leaves and grandest passages and mutilated it in many places. I should not like to think that some demigod had come before me and picked out some of the best stars. I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. I'm just going to keep reading here for a second. Over the past 10 years on the bay, I have tried to gather up scraps torn from the poem. I've collected them from Veronica, from her mentor Lane, from the turtle man Antonio, from the wandering drama critic Crutch, and from many others. With my hands full of ragged bits and scraps, I might be inclined to believe that the bay has been more severely rifled, more drastically abridged than other places I've lived or visited. But the opposite is true. In the bay, many passages were lost so recently that people I knew could recite them. And the poem, paired and slashed though it was, remained sufficiently coherent to betray certain gaps. In other places I've been, so much was lost, and lost so long ago, that there are hardly reminders of the poem's former content. Who on the eastern seaboard is struck by the absence of migrating gray whales, or nesting sea turtles, or playful and clever sea mink, or river frothing runs of salmon and eel? Yet they were all there, and there in great abundance. We live amid the wreckage, yet we hardly notice that something has changed. So how, how is Cameron's funny line a solution to this problem? Well, what happens when you take an animal as the starting point for your stories and allow yourself to be digressive is that those narratives that you're talking about, they inevitably branch out in time and space, and you, you run into the holes. Essentially, you're narrating the, the extended poem of the creature. On the, on the terrace that day, we were, we were reciting the extended poem of Isostichopus fuscus. Or let me use Thoreau's other metaphor, the constellation. Say you're looking at the sky, and from the Big Dipper, that star that's at the very front of the ladle is missing. You're going to notice, right? You'll know. If any other star in the sky, some star that's not a part of a constellation, were gone, you would never notice. But because it's connected in this shape, you, you realize, ah, oh, there's, a, there's a hole there. The same thing happens in, in our stories about organisms. The stories are like those lines that connect the stars. They connect one animal to another animal to another animal to another animal. So when you tell those stories, you, you run into the tears of the poem or the, the tears in the fabric of the sky. Let me give you an example. Um, the manta ray. So the manta ray uh, is it's a, it's about 25 feet across, uh, manta birostris. Um, there are smaller animals uh, that people sometimes call manta rays, which are only about four or five feet across. Those are members of the genus, genus Mobula. So when I started looking into the history of manta rays and mobula in the Bay of LA, started telling those stories, the earliest uh, accounts I found were from the 1700s. They were from the pearling industry in the Gulf of California. The reason the pearling industry was interested in manta rays is they were convinced that manta rays presented a unique threat to pearl divers. <laughs> they thought that every time a pearl diver went down, a manta ray might come over it and wait for him to come up, at which point they would envelop him and devour him, which was nonsense because um, manta rays are actually filter feeders. <laughs> but uh, this was the account in 1744. And, um, and so they wrote a lot about manta rays. But then you think, pearl industry. What pearl industry? There's no pearl industry in the Sea of Cortez. They describe coastlines that are covered in oyster reefs. Those coastlines now are beaches. They're lovely beaches. But the pearls, the pearl oysters were forgotten a long time ago. There were two species there. One was the species that created that, the black pearl that Steinbeck wrote about, and one was a species that created a, an opalescent pearl that's to this day very rare. Um, if we find one of those oysters now, it's, it's a big deal. It's like the brown cucumber. We bring the students together, we show them to it, we talk about it. It used to be the coastline. 
So following the manta ray forward in time, um, after the pearling industry collapsed, the next threat for them was kind of incidental catch by fishing boats. Fishermen would um, take their harpoons and uh, go after a manta ray if they saw it, just because, why not? It was a big animal. Maybe I can get it. Harpoons. Why does a fishing boat have harpoons? They don't anymore. They now have fish traps and small fish nets. They had harpoons because they were looking for turtles. And there were four species of turtle in the Sea of Cortez, and they're now all endangered. And some, you, you do see one now and then, but the other three you hardly ever see. So you, you see what I mean? You see how once you start following the story of one animal, you just inevitably bump up into the, the demise of, of other creatures. That's why I think Cameron's line is, in a way, a, a possible solution to this, to this problem of, of the shifting baseline. Because if we tell these stories, then we, we make our way back in time, inevitably. And we move out across the, the ecological fabric and see where it's been torn. That has risks of its own. It, it, uh, it can lead to despair <laughs> and indifference because who really wants to go on an eco tour in a, in, a, in a graveyard? But here too, I think Cameron's line might, might help us because what are we doing when we situate an animal in that web of connections to other animals and to us and its history? In a way, what we're doing is we're recovering the meaning of that animal because what's meaning but but a set of connections, right? I mean, what is the meaning of a word in a language? It's the connections between that word and all the other words. What's the meaning in a human life? It's the connection between an individual and all the other people and all the other greater entities that that person is involved with. So when you start resituating the animal in its history and in its ecology, you're recovering a sense of the meaning and the value. I mean, it's it's easy to feel indifferent towards an ugly brown lump on the bottom of the seafloor, but when it comes to the surface on Veronica's palm and you start talking about holothurin and the East Asian market and the idea of recapitulation, suddenly this thing is, is meaningful in a way. I think that that kind of storytelling is a way that we might hold in our minds the two kinds of visions of nature that have been in play here. One is kind of amazing and interesting and even awe-inspiring. The other is a clear-eyed vision of how dilapidated our natural world is. And if we're going to have any chance of, of reconstructing it, we're going to have to hold on to both of those ways of seeing nature, awe-inspiring and, frankly, degraded. Let me just close with a, a reading about that. One evening, I thought I'd search the internet for reports of mantas in the bay. I entered the words manta ray, Bahia de Los Angeles, and when I pressed return, I received several pages of links. For a moment, I thought the manta might be faring better than I'd believed, but as I began clicking through, glancing at snapshots, reading a line or two, it became clear that all the reports were of leaping mobula species, not actually None actually involved Manta birostris. That's the bigger 25-foot animal. Most of the photos, however, bore captions that identified the flying creatures as manta rays. What was in the process of happening in Bahia with the word mantaraya had already happened on the internet with the term manta ray. That is, this word, the name mantaraya, had been transferred from a 25-foot species, 25-foot animal to a five-foot animal. And this struck me as a very vivid instance of the quiet, stepwise change in our idea of nature. The name of a huge species had been bequeathed to a small one. Alongside some of the mislabeled photos of Mobula munchiana were accounts of nice trips people had taken. Here are some excerpts. Not easy to reach, but worth the journey, especially for those who value unspoiled nature more than a mint on the pillow. If Baja is one of North America's last great wildernesses, then L.A. Bay is Baja's crown jewel of untouched beauty. Civilization hasn't changed the place much. The hundreds of miles of coastal cliffs, beaches, and coves are still as pristine as when the Seri and Cochimi Indians fished the same shores 
and islands centuries ago. We go in search of wilderness, and so it is wilderness we find, and we write home about it. We tell the story of our rediscovery of nature. We compose suitably lyrical prose. We send back photos, and their iconography is just right. We hold up the large fish we've just caught. We recline on a white sandy beach. A winged ray leaps from the water. These are our dispatches from the wilderness. But when those snapshots are held up against images from the past, something is a bit off. Our fish is rather small, or maybe it's not a fish at all, but rather an enormous squid. That beach is hardly pristine. In fact, before the oysters were removed, it was not a beach at all. And that ray, it is two and a half feet across, not 25. I, too, am awestruck by the monstrous squid, lured by the beach, thrilled by the leaping ray. But how can we reconcile our sincere wonderment in the face of what natural wonders we still have with our recognition that what we are seeing is miserably dilapidated? On the one hand, a skein of rays, and, the, and on the other, the likelihood that they are but fry. We must be careful, I think, to hold on to both, not to let one wash away the other. For if we permit ourselves to indulge too thoroughly in wonderment, we will forget where we are on this long stairway downward. But if we let our sense of history overwhelm our wonderment, leaving us with nothing but blasé weariness of the unimpressive present, then we won't much care where we are. What we must do, perhaps, is cultivate our craft of seeing more than one thing at a time. Thanks.